good morning, everybody, and welcome to another broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but we do have some new classes too, and so if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Happy March 1st, everybody. I'm so excited to dive in with today's topic, but I do want to give you just a quick shout out on everything we did back in February. February, as some of you may know, was our entire month solely dedicated to the most amazing women in science and exploration on planet Earth. We did 55 broadcasts with everyone from neuroscientists to cave divers, astronaut trainers, and more. It was really quite incredible, and you can check out all those programs on our YouTube channel. But today we're kicking it off with a bang. An hour and a half ago, I got the chance to hang out with our friends at the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica with Baby Sloss. And right now we are diving in with my favorite series of the year, and that is in conjunction with the amazing folks at Wild Hope. Wild Hope, for those who don't know, is just the greatest series of all time showcasing positive stories about conservation. It can seem a little daunting sometimes in the world about all the threats that are facing biodiversity and habitats around the globe. And Wild Hope is meant to showcase some of those positive stories of people that are really dedicated and passionate and knowledgeable working to make the world a better place. So I really encourage you to check out the Wild Hope series in general. All their main stories are on YouTube as well. And we've been partnering with them for this really fun time over the last couple of months. We hung out with Mary Reynolds last month talking about going from a gardener to a guardian, uh, planting gardens and protecting local biodiversity that way. And we started off in January with Callie Broadus talking about nature having rights in Ecuador and her amazing work at Reserva the Youth Land Trust. But today we're diving with Pete Malinowski. He is the founder of the Billion Oyster Project, something that I wanted to feature on this broadcast for ages because it is the gold standard of conservation in an urban center. When we think of big cities, you think of nothing more than New York City. Uh, if anyone who's had the chance to go, it's a really special place, but it's not a place that we usually think of when it comes to wildlife. So Pete's going to explain why we're wrong about that and some of the cool stuff that he and his amazing team get to do to help conserve the waterways there through oyster, which is another creature that we haven't featured much here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I'm going to bring Pete in for a minute, say hello, share a little clip from the Wild Hope session, and then we're going to dive in with a really cool presentation together. So Pete, welcome to the broadcast, man. Thank you so much for joining today. Hi, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to it be here. So it's so nice to get to feature this for the first time. I know you've got a lot to share with us, but as I said, I'm going to start off with this little clip from Wild Hope, and then if you want to bring up your presentation, we can dive in right after that. Crazy. Um, I didn't like oysters. I thought it was. I thought oysters was disgusting. The thing that really changed my mind was like all of this information about how oysters are good for the environment. Because they're filter feeders, oysters pull water through their bodies. And the uh, gills sort through the different particles in the water, decide what the oyster's going to eat and what it's going to reject. Want to get New York Harbor to the point where every piling, every bulkhead is just completely covered with live oysters. We realized that the only chance for us to be successful in restoring one billion oysters to New York Harbor was to leverage the incredible diversity of talent and expertise that exists in New York City. We think if we get as many people involved as possible, we'll be able to do this hard thing together. And that's something that is exciting. That's something we can all kind of get excited about. Let's go, let's go, let's go. How cool is that? I love the, the the contrast between the tank with oysters and not. Like that is quite incredible. How long does that take? Like an hour? Yeah, just like an hour. And so we've got, so, I mean, you're so far beyond a dozen oysters in a tank here. They talked about over a hundred million have been planted so far. Um, where are you at now? Is there like a latest update on how many you've gone and, and what sort of the next couple of years might hold? Yeah, so we uh, so far in about the last 10 years, we've restored 125 million oysters. So we have 875 million to go, which is a lot, but um, we're doing more every year. So this year we hope to have our first 50 million oyster year during the, the summer months and um, get to a billion oysters in the next 11 years is our goal. I think if anyone can accomplish it, it's you. And I'd love if you take the chance to dive in and share more of the story of everything you've been up to over this last decade. All right, we'll do. I'm going to share my screen here. Perfect. While you're doing that, I'll just say some of our classes might have a few tech problems. If you need to head to YouTube, I promise it, it should work there if you have any trouble with us in StreamYard. Um, but however it works, we'd love to have you. And with that, 
we will dive in. Let's do it. Please. All right, here we go. So I'm obviously going to be talking about the Billion Oyster Project. I'm going to give a little history of New York City and New York Harbor and then get into the nuts and bolts of how we are working to restore oysters to New York Harbor. So first of all, here we go. Oh, I want to talk a little bit about myself first. Sorry. So I, I grew up on a small oyster farm, a family run oyster farm in Fishers Island, New York. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And I was very lucky to spend a lot of my time growing up in on and under the water working on the farm swimming around the oysters and getting to know the ecosystem and how to keep oysters alive through that and that connection to the natural world was very important for me in developing billion oyster project and uh, trying to provide that type of experience to as many people as possible so i would ask that everyone here just think for a minute about a place that you like to go or your family likes to go that's outside. Maybe it's a park or a beach or a vacation spot somewhere or a backyard or anything like that. And just think about the how important it is to be able to have an outdoor space that you know. And the reality is that a lot of people in cities, I don't know how many of you live in cities, but young people growing up in cities don't have that opportunity as much as folks like me who grew up in the country. So we want to provide that kind of experience for as many people as possible. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of Manhattan before development, so in pre-colonial times. And uh, when, when colonists first arrived in New York Harbor, they described, they sailed over from Europe and they described seeing more animals than they had ever seen anywhere in their entire lives. And they wrote home and said, we'll never need to go anywhere else for fish. There's more fish here than we could ever possibly eat. And they describe not being able to even see the sky for, for minutes on end because there were so many birds flying over and being able to catch fish just by lowering a basket over the side of the boat and bringing it back up. So we're talking about a waterway, a huge 250,000 acre harbor that was entirely full of living things. And that's the history of New York Harbor. That's where we started from. And at that time, the backbone of the ecosystem that provided the support for all of that abundance were oyster reefs. So all of the water in New York City used to be full of these big three-dimensional reefs that acted just like coral reefs or like the trees in a forest to create this really interesting and dynamic ecosystem that allowed for all of those fish to survive. And of course, what we did after settling in New York City, what we've done everywhere in the world where there's oysters is in a pretty short amount of time, about 100 years, we ate all of the oysters. And that, the oysters were eaten all over the city. Uh, New York City was famous for the, for the oysters and people would travel to New York just to try them and they were shipped all over the world. And it only took about 100 years for all that entire landscape, 250,000 acres of oyster reefs to be consumed and removed from the ecosystem. And then after that, and here you can see on the top right, you can see some piles of shell that were harvested from the harbor and oyster cart over here. And then once the harbor had no more oysters in it, there were far fewer fish and other animals. And we turned New York Harbor into a giant dump. And New Yorkers dumped everything, trash, human waste, dead horses, all kinds of everything that, that we were done using on the land, we just poured into the harbor. And that created a harbor that was disgusting to be around, dangerous to touch, it smelled bad, it looked bad, It uh, you could get sick if you went in the water, it was dangerous, and that existed in New York City for a long time, from the mid-1800s all the way up until the late 1900s, the, the harbor in New York City was a off-putting, scary, dangerous, and disgusting place. But that's not true anymore. So now, because of good regulation, the harbor is much cleaner than it used to be. It's no longer, you're no longer allowed to pour um, waste or pollution or use the harbor as a trash can. And because of that, the water has gotten much cleaner and it's actually safe to swim in, safe to eat the fish out of most days of the year. There's still definitely some issues facing the harbor water, water quality, but for the most part, it's far cleaner than it was. The problem is that we as New Yorkers who live in the city, even though we live in a city where four of the five boroughs are on islands and there's rivers and bays throughout the, throughout the city and most New Yorkers go over or, or under the water to get to and from work, most streets in New York end at the water's edge. 
But despite all of that, we don't think of ourselves as living in a port city or living surrounded by an important natural ecosystem. And that's because there was this hundred year period when the harbor was gross and disgusting. So most New Yorkers still think about the harbor as a scary, polluted place. And that's what we're trying to change with Billion Oyster Project. We're trying to restore the ecosystem, build back the habitat that used to be in the harbor, bring the animals back to the harbor and get New Yorkers involved in that work so that through the process of being engaged in a large scale ecosystem restoration project, people get excited about the harbor, want to take care of it and want to live and work and play in, in the water that surrounds the city. So how do we do that? We launched Billion Oyster Project about 10 years ago now, and we're trying to engage 1 million people in restoring 1 billion oysters by 2035. 1 billion oysters is the enough oysters to get the population to a point where it can grow on its own. And a million people, that's one in 10 New Yorkers roughly by 2035. So we think that if one in 10 New Yorkers play a role in making the harbor a better place, then that will change the relationship that the city has with the ecosystem around them. Around them. One of the big ways we do that is working with public school students at the New York Harbor School and at um, middle schools all throughout the city. So students at the Harbor School specialize in marine careers. So they learn, they decide whether they want to learn aquaculture, vessel operations, driving boats, marine systems, which is maintaining and fixing boats, marine biology and research, ocean engineering, professional scuba diving, welding, or marine policy and environmental advocacy. And once the students special decide which field they wanna specialize in, they have different opportunities to work together with Billion Oyster Project to help restore oysters to New York Harbor. So in this picture, you're seeing students who are in the aquaculture program, they grew the oysters that they're measuring now. So those students grow oysters that we use for our restoration projects and then go into the field here right under the Manhattan Bridge in Brooklyn and measure the oysters that they've restored, make sure that they're surviving and providing habitat for other animals. Students in the welding program build all of our reef structures. So here students are welding together a steel cage that will be used for one of our restoration sites to simulate a natural oyster reef. And we choose our, we design our restoration projects to require the skills that Harbor School students are learning. So they have an opportunity to practice those skills in a real world environment. I could show you pictures of science, students being scientists or being scuba divers, but we're going to keep moving ahead. These students are not Harbor School students. So in addition to the work that Harbor School students do, we also work with middle schools all around the city. And those middle school teachers attend professional development uh, sessions at on Governor's Island at our headquarters to learn how to teach about oysters. They use our curriculum, they help us write curriculum, and then we provide those schools with a oyster research station, which is a wire box filled with live oysters and other science equipment that they can use with their students at the water's edge. And this is a really key way that we're able to get young people all over the city working in, uh, on the water's edge and getting to know oysters and fish and crabs and shrimp and seahorses and all of the other animals that live in New York Harbor. For many of these students, this is their, their first experience with wild animals other than pigeons. You know, wild animals that are existing in a natural environment and they get to hold the crabs, keep the fish alive, get to know them, and then um, take care of the, their little section of oyster reef that is that oyster research station. So today and every other school day, there are middle school students down at the water's edge in New York City measuring and maintaining oyster reefs. We also have field stations. This is another community engagement exercise, less for schools, more for volunteer groups, com other community groups, throughout the city and field stations are waterfront sites where we want to do long-term large-scale oyster restoration, but we start with small reefs that are accessible from shore and allow people to get down into the water and do the same things that those students are doing. These are just some pictures from our field station sites. Some are at beaches, 
or places where you can wade down into the water. And we have a couple sites that are accessible only by human powered boats. So you see a canoe here monitoring an oyster reef in, uh, in Brooklyn. And here students are installing one of our oyster reefs. This is in Coney Island Creek. These students were actually able to, through water quality testing, identify a source of pollution. So they noticed that the water quality was worse here than it should have been, called the authorities. The authorities found that one of the apartment complexes had a problem with their wastewater that was coming right into the creek. And because the students were working there and testing the water, we were able to stop that from happening and make the harbor a little cleaner because of it. And that's an, ex that's an example of how important it is to actually be down at, at, on the water and in the water and measuring water quality and trying to figure out how you can make it better because it can make a very real difference. We also operate a shell collection program. So this is our shell collection truck that goes around to 75 restaurants in Brooklyn and Manhattan and, and collects the trash oyster shells, the used oyster shells that are generated at those restaurants. And we bring those back to Governor's Island and use them as a substrate to build oyster reefs. And with this program, we're able to get about 7,000 pounds of shell out of the waste stream and back into the harbor. Without the shell collection program, all of those shells will be put in black plastic bags and driven to landfills. And so we're really happy to be able to remove those from the waste stream and use them for a positive purpose instead of just throwing them out. And we've we've collected about two and a half million pounds of shell since we started doing this in 2014. And that's about as enough shell to fill a gym, fill a gymnasium. Let's give you an idea how big that is. Here's our large scale reef construction system. So this is in, in Brooklyn in the, in the uh, Red Hook container terminals. And we've actually modified, I think you can see my mouse, but we've modified shipping containers and turned them into tanks that we use for our aquaculture purposes. So we fill the uh, tanks with our reef structures that are built by Harbor School students and then fill them up with water, add tiny oyster larvae. Oyster, oysters are just like butterflies. They have a larval stage and an adult stage. And when they're larvae, they swim around and look for something to attach onto. And we want them to attach to those reef structures so that we can restore them as oyster reefs. And you can see here the containers, the tanks filled with oysters and reef structures being placed onto a barge for deployment. And I think the next, yeah, so here's that barge. And let's see if this works. I can show you what that looks like. So this is a barge ready for deployment. The oysters at this point are on the reef structures. You can see on the right what they look like. They're just tiny little dots on these shells that we've collected from restaurants. You can see the little oysters here. And then the crane is lifting those reef structures. Each one of those reef structures, let's go back so you can see that again. That's a cool part. So the each one of those reef structures has about 100,000 tiny little oysters on it. And they go into the water in the uh, in an array to simulate a large, large oyster reef that used to be in this exact spot. And the idea is over time, the oysters grow through the cages and be become a small oyster reef there. And you can see what it looks like. So this is a small section of an oyster reef that's been in the water for about a year and a half. And you can see that the oysters grow through the mesh of the cage and are sticking out. And you can really see how they create this three-dimensional habitat that can be used by fish, shrimp, crabs, and all these other animals. Because without the oysters there, the bottom is flat and featureless. There's nowhere to hide, nothing to eat, and the fish have nowhere to go. But once you put an oyster reef down, it immediately becomes a center for animals to congregate around. They eat the oysters, they eat the oysters poop, they eat um, all the other little worms and critters that, that come to live amongst the oyster reef. And so in about two weeks after we put an oyster reef in the water, that site becomes, is just a, uh, goes from being flat and empty to being totally full of fish, shrimp, crabs, snails, all kinds of cool stuff. Super exciting to watch that happen. These are just a few of the animals we see regularly on our oyster reefs. So you have a, a sponge, a seahorse, an oyster toadfish that actually eats the oysters, a mud, a mud crab, which also eats the oysters, a really pretty tunicate. These are, uh, it's called botrylis. It's a golden star tunicate. They're very nice to look at. 
and then oyster drills, which also eat the oysters. But that's one of the things that oysters do is they provide food for other animals. So we want all the animals to have the food they need. And some of those are actually eating the oysters as well. This is a tough slide to look at. So sorry about that. But what you have here is th this on the left is New York Harbor. You have the Hudson River coming down into the harbor, the upper bay here, when this is where the Statue of Liberty is and Governor's Island, and then out into Long Island Sound, up the East River out into Long Island Sound. And the circles are our oyster reefs. And we're trying what we're trying to do is spread out this new population of oysters that we're restoring to the harbor so that each each part of the harbor has the benefit of that restoration and the oysters when they re reproduce their larvae is, is coming from all sides to repopulate the area in the middle where the oysters used to be and then on the right you can see our the waterfront sites where we have oyster research stations community reefs field stations water quality testing where we're again trying to spread that out all around the city so that we can get an idea of how things are doing and work to restore oysters from all sides. This is a, um, a plan for a new development that is, so a new residential development in, in New York City, doesn't have anything to do with Billion Oyster Project, except that the people building the project have decided to incorporate oyster reefs into their, into their design, have a beach where people can walk down into the water, have human powered boating, so kayaks and canoes, and actually change the shoreline of New York City to allow New Yorkers more access to the harbor. And we like to think that this type of project is an example of how the city can change to make the harbor more a part of everyday life in the city. And these last two slides are just pictures of New York Harbor that I like. So I grew up working on the water and uh, spent a lot of time really enjoying how nice water is to look at and how it changes your perspective being on the water and looking back at the land and i've been very lucky to have that experience in new york city a lot also i work on the water now and new york harbor has become you know one of my favorite places in the entire world to spend my time just because it's so nice to look at and it's um, it makes you appreciate the city in a different way being on the water. And you can tell here, just looking at the slide, that there's a lot of water in just a little city. And that's kind of a funny way to think about New York City, but it's all about being on the water and changing how you think about the world around you. And this is the East River, which many people think of as a toxic waste dump. I'm here to tell you that it is not a toxic waste dump. It can be incredibly beautiful, nice to swim in. I actually once a year swim across the East River to go to work every, um, to go to my office on Governor's Island. And it's just um, New York Harbor is a beautiful place. And if we're able to restore oyster reefs, we can see this, this place full of animals once again, like it used to be. And um, it's coming back, it's happening. So there are more, there were over 200 whales sighted in New York Harbor this year alone. We see dolphins, seals, seahorses that I mentioned, all kinds of cool birds. They're all coming back to the Harbor because the water's cleaner, there's more habitat there, and it's just a super exciting time to be doing this kind of work in a place like New York City, because you can actually watch the change happen before your eyes. And I dream of a time when everyone in New York City knows that they can walk down to the water's edge and count on seeing fish and birds and seals and whales and dolphins and all of that. And I think that if we able to get everyone working together, that we'll be able to get there. And I think that's that's all I have. I have a little more background, happy to talk about, but I'm really excited to hear your questions and do any of that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Pete, uh, I get the privilege in this job of getting to hang out with some very cool people all over the world, and I get to hang out with all sorts of great conservation stories and feature them in these broadcasts. I have donated in the middle of a broadcast five times ever, and this was one of them. So I, 25 bucks, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little start, <laughs> but like you've thought of everything. That is an amazing story, and thank you so much for sharing it. Honestly, that was incredible. Um, I want to stress for our classes too, like it's amazing to have this chance to talk about New York City Harbor today, but find local waterways, wherever you are. If you're in South Carolina, if you're in London, Ontario, we've got classes in Maryland, uh, all over North America today. 
go to your local water body. Maybe it's a river, a stream, a pond. Uh, there are efforts in Toronto where I grew up to clean up the dawn for the Olympics coming this summer in Paris. They're cleaning up the Seine and it's going to be swimmable for the first time in about 100 years. It's going to be part of the Olympic ceremony. So there's this huge movement now to recognize that these bodies of water that are in our big cities, in our urban areas, are worthy of protection, are important to save the biodiversity in them. And there's honestly, there's never been a better story than this one. So way to go, Pete. That was great. Um, we're going to dive in with questions, as you said. I'm going to take a quick one from our online crews and then our environmental leaders. I'm heading to you guys, our help crew, uh, grade 10s, in just a second. But our first question was, how long does it take to raise the oysters? You talked about this really cool project with schools. Um, is this months? Is it years? What's the deal? Yeah, so oysters spend, um, when, when they're being grown, Oh, we froze. <laughs> We're going to get Pete back in a second. This is the joy of video broadcast is that something should go a little bit wrong every now and then. Otherwise, it's no fun. Um, so hopefully Pete's back in just a quarter second. Oh, I think we got him back again. Hey, Pete. Hey, we, sorry. We were, too, we were too excited and you started to answer and it just shut the system down with the enthusiasm. Yeah. So I'll leave it to you again. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So the uh, um, it, oysters spend about a month of their life swimming around. And so in a hatchery environment, the, the, in an aquaculture environment, they're inside of tanks being grown for about a month. And then when they attach to shells and are ready to start the rest of their lives, they go out into one of our oyster reefs or an oyster research station. And then oysters can actually live for a very long time. So the oysters you that people eat are generally between two and four years old. Um, but oysters will continue living for a very long time. There's actually no natural senescence in oysters, so they don't get old, but eventually something will eat them or something will kill them, so they don't live for that long. Yeah, how neat is that? I didn't know that. Um, by the way, I love that you featured in your program the things that do eat oysters, like you're replanting them, but it's good to have that ecosystem. Like We want there to be things that are devouring these things as well, and that's something that we yeah. don't cover in a lot of our programs. So. Cool question, guys. To kick us off, we're going to head to our environmental leaders in the Missing Cause class. I'm coming to you guys in just a minute, so everyone can flick on their microphones. Um, welcome in, Mr. Pleasures class. Hi, guys. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Oh, great. I was wondering, what are some challenges that the project has faced, and how have you overcome those challenges? Ooh. Great question. There's so much. Um, the you know. New York Harbor is a lot cleaner than it used to be, but it still has some water quality issues that are that are challenging to work around. The uh, it's also a very busy port, so there's a lot of competing uses for the harbor. There's container ships and ferries and barges moving around all the time, so that's a little bit of a challenge. But we figured out how to work. Um, the Billion Oyster Project works hard to be friends with everybody, and so we figured out how to work with those commercial interests so they don't mind us planting oyster reefs. Um, there's a lot of rules, so. Uh, it's hard to get permission to put oysters in the water. It's hard to get permission to put teenagers in the water in scuba gear. It's hard to get permission to change what teaching and learning looks like in high schools. It's hard for teachers to get permission to get their uh, students out of class on field trips. And so there's a lot of you know what we think of as red tape, that um, bureaucracy that we have to find our way through in order to make things happen. And that's been a big challenge. You know, there's a there's a million rules to keep bad things out of the water, but there are no rules to help put good things back. And that's been a real challenge for us. Um, you know, another challenge is that oysters are, their, um, their offspring, the larvae, swim, swim and are driven by current far, currents far away from the, where their parents are, and there's no way to track or know where they're gonna go. And so in order to build a population back we have to put oysters in a lot of different places and, and just hope that some of the babies will end up where some of our reef sites are and that's that's a pretty complex and challenging problem uh, we're we're a not non-profit organization so we're all of our work is based on philanthropy so we're always limited by the amount of fun funding we have the amount of money we have to do our work that's always a challenge uh what else you know, it's not always easy to train teenagers to do the heavy lifting of oyster restoration. That's a challenge and been really impressed with my time. I used to be a high school teacher at, at the New York Harbor School, um, watching you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds really rise to that challenge. That's been fun. Sometimes our oyster reefs don't work at all. 
So all of them are research projects. We're trying to figure out where the best place is and where they, um, you know, where the reef will persist and survive. And sometimes we'll put a reef down and it will be immediately covered with mud. Sometimes all of the oysters will be immediately eaten by other animals. And sometimes they do really well. And so it's all about just trial and error, learning from what works and what doesn't work. We always learn more from what doesn't work than we do from what does work. And that's a good lesson from Billion Oyster Project. But those those failures are really opportunities for learning and changing our strategy. Is that all, Pete? Those are the only <laughs> challenges. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I did love when you showcased this high school at the beginning because, like, I don't know about you kids, but, like, that looks like the coolest high school of all time. Like, I wish I had a school like that growing up, but I had some pretty cool opportunities in school. Um, I want to note for teenagers, in fact, for younger than teenagers, we talked about scuba diving very briefly in that answer. Uh, at eight years old, you can start on the path of being a scuba diver with this program. So I always, whenever we get to highlight scuba diving, it opens up 70% of the world to you. So if you want to explore New York Harbor or explore coral reefs next month, when we bring on our, our folks in Hawaii talking about coral restoration, uh, that's a really magical way of exploring a world. So do check that out. Speaking of kids that are old enough to start on that path, we're gonna head to Missy Cotta's class. Um, your school just joining us all day today. So let's see if this all works. Hello guys, South Carolina. Hey. Hi. 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 Oh, perfect. Welcome in. <laughs> so Hello. I'm actually got any questions? I'm actually a teacher and in South Carolina now, but I was part of the Billion Oyster Project fellowship like pre-COVID before I moved down here. So they're like, Miss Sincata talks about oysters a lot and aquaculture. They probably think I'm crazy. But I was like, when I saw this, I said we have to jump on. Um, we've been talking about the nitrogen cycle and all that, so I've been able to tie in what I learned from the Billion Oyster Project into that. Um, Aiden, come in front of the class. We have a question for Mr. Malinowski. Why did you pick this job? What makes <laughs> this job? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the so I moved to New York City after uh, after I graduated from college and was trying to become a teacher. That was my plan was to be a teacher. And I and I found the New York Harbor School and it was a school dedicated to hands on experiential education. And that made a ton of sense to me. And so I started volunteering with the school, started talking about growing oysters at the school. We had we had a fish. We had fish tanks in our classroom. I flooded the school a bunch of times with my aquaculture systems I was building in a classroom in the middle of Brooklyn. And then when the school moved to Governor's Island, we were able to grow oysters at the school and we just started doing it. And so the, it, my job didn't exist before I, I had it. So it's not like I saw a job and said, I want to, I want that job. We just, me and the other founders of Billion Oyster Project, the people we work, we were working with just built this nonprofit, built this organization around an idea and then um and then it became a job so it was more it was less about wanting a job and more about wanting to accomplish a specific thing restore oysters to new york harbor with public school students and that just just trying to do that and it became a job yep. uh that was a very thoughtful answer to a very direct question so thank you for that guys and truly, this is one of the joys of this whole Wild Hope series. I think to a person, every single person that we're going to be featuring in this 10-part series has the same story. Like, this wasn't something that they were like, oh, I'm going to apply for that and do it. It was, this is a passion, and I want to make this happen. And it's led to some really spectacular conservation stories around the globe. So whether you're interested in conservation like the two of us or not, whatever you're keen on, you can make that into a role if you are dedicated enough and uh, put in the work to make it so. So great question, guys. We're going to go back to our environmental leaders, and I'm going to take two more from our online crew, and we'll wrap up with Miss Nakata after that. Uh, hey, London, welcome back. Hi. Um, does the repopulation of wildlife in the harbor affect things like air quality and general health of people near it? Interesting question. Um, I would argue yes. Um, I think that it doesn't... So, so to the air quality... And uh, water quality, I don't think there's an appreciable impact, a significant impact from the wildlife. The, the people, there's so many people in New York City that the impact that people have on air quality and water quality is so much more than animals would be able to have. So I don't think it affects air quality or water quality to have the wildlife back in the harbor. But it does affect the quality of life for all New Yorkers. And that's what I was getting at earlier, earlier at, at the very beginning. 
that living in a place surrounded by wild animals, knowing the ecosystem around you and having that be part of your life, I, I think is a very important thing for long-term health and well-being of a community. Um, but it's not a uh, something that would immediately show up in um, you know at the doctor's office. But I think it is a it's a it's a really important thing for humans to have access to nature and get to know living things and wild animals and wild wild ecosystems. And so I would argue yes. I can't for the life of me remember her name this very moment, but this all came really together as a great question quickly. Um, there's a doctor in Canada, and this is a program that happens here, but it happens in the United States, all around the world, that is like nature prescriptions or park prescriptions, where literally national parks, provincial parks, whatever, or state parks are partnering with doctors where they can prescribe that as a remedy to issues. There are a lot of literal physical ailments you can have or mental ailments that you can have that being around nature, having access, walking in parks, seeing restored harbors can make you better. That is one of the most profound, exciting things in science in the last few years with a huge array of evidence to back it up. And uh, I can speak from my own experience in Toronto, like the way that they've changed that harbor to be more amenable to nature and put parkland along it has been transformative in my life growing up there in the first 29 years of my life. I live in a place now with so much more nature and it, it does, it makes you feel better every single day. So what a neat approach to the question, guys. Thank you so much uh, in London. Let's take a couple more from our online crew and then we're gonna head back to South Carolina. Uh, one of the questions is, do any other cities do this? Is there a billion oyster project in London or in Paris or anywhere else around the world? Are you setting up the stage to do that? Are there secret plans in Perth? What's the deal? Um, no secret plans, but the, uh, I, I mean, there are so there are cities there, there are oyster restoration projects all over the world um and there's for those of you down in maryland there's a huge project in the chesapeake bay far bigger than billion oyster project the oyster recovery partnership they they restore uh the chesapeake bay is a lot bigger than new york harbor and they restore a lot more oysters than we do uh, what makes billion oyster project really unique is that it's happening in the middle of a big city and and it's the direct involvement of young people um so I, I think that what we've created here in new york can be a model for any any uh waterfront city in the world there are some other places that are hong kong has started doing some oyster restoration in urban urban areas um, but it's pretty limited so i don't know i think that someday billion oyster project will work in those other places but we'll see no secret plans yet I think with the enthusiasm of our kids, it's uh, near certainty. I, I want to come down and help you out in New York right after the broadcast, basically. Um, I do want to note, if you want to check out that project as well, I just found the website for it, oysterrecovery.org. Lots to explore there if you want to follow up, and I'll make sure all our classes have that link as well. Let's head back to our friend in South Carolina, Margin Elementary. Hi, guys. Unmute again, and uh, come join us. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, are there any, like... <laughs> Are you guys working with working with other um, states or states areas or areas like yeah. that work with the that are restoring oysters? Restoring oysters. <laughs> I'm a little nervous at the end there. Thank you. So she was asking, are there other areas of the world that you're directly working with that are helping to restore oysters in other parts? Yeah, right now um, it, it's a it's a pretty tight knit community. So there are people in the Chesapeake Bay, in Galveston Bay, in South Carolina, North Carolina, um, California, Washington State, and Oregon who are all doing oyster restoration. And we all get together every once in a while, every couple of years, to um, at, at academic conferences and gatherings to sort of share best practices and work together in that way. So we, we share information, we share best practices, stories, things that work well, things that didn't, but there's no, we don't do a lot of work outside of New York City. Fantastic, a great question, guys. And uh, since we've gone pretty fast through all this, we're gonna take one more from our environmental leaders. I wanna note for all our kids, I will be messaging your teachers with this in a minute, but billionoysterproject.org, there's so much more to explore there. This will be on our YouTube channel, so if you wanna check it out, or check out the entire Wild Hope episode about it. I'll make sure you have the link to that. Uh, that little clip at the beginning was just a small smattering of what you can explore with all this. Um, and please do stay tuned for our email. We've got a great survey. We'd love to have your feedback on all this because I think you guys will love this as much as I have. And uh, if you're joining on YouTube after the fact, welcome in as well. 
come on back in, uh, Environmental Leader Crew, to wrap us up. Hey. Hi. Um, you mentioned that bird species are returning to feast on the oysters and the animals that are coming back with the oysters. Is there anything being done for the lack of habitat for those returning bird species? Interesting. Yeah, not not a whole lot. So there there are um, a little bit. So there are some islands in the harbor that where there isn't any development, and those are set aside as bird sanctuaries. Um, and but the birds just kind of find the best places to hang out. So there are, uh, you know, there were bald eagles in Prospect Park for the first time trying to build a nest. Ospreys end up building their nests on top of light posts and in the corner of buildings and in other places where things that people have made are allow them to. Um, so the sort of nature finds a way, but we still think of, which is unfortunate, but a lot of people in New York City sort of think that they're, you're either in a city or you're in a natural place. And there's not, those two things are not the same. And one of the things we're trying to do is to change that. So we, we, we I, I would agree with you that we need to restore more bird habitat. We need to be able to have a city where there's a ton of people and also the ability to protect, preserve, and restore wildlife in the same spot. But that stuff happens slowly. I can't encourage our kids enough. When you're done this broadcast, it means skip the rest of your day or not. Probably stay in school. But when you're done your school day, uh, iNaturalist and Seek are tools that we use for our Backyard Bio Project in May. So we get kids going out all over the world to explore their local neck of the woods, find what they can find in terms of wildlife. And if you use iNaturalist, you can type in your city, if you're in Charleston, New York, London, Toronto, whatever, and it'll show you all the wildlife that you can explore in your neck of the woods. You can type in a species and see if you have osprey in your town or bald eagles. I discovered that there was so much that lives where I used to live. Um, that was amazing that I had no idea where to look for that or even to think to look for that. So those are really amazing tools. Again, I'll link those to all our teachers when we wrap up. Um, Pete, before we, we finish and we bring in our classes to say thank you and farewell, is there any last message you want to share with our kids just to drive the point home and lead them on more Billion Oyster Project explorations? <laughs> yeah, all, all, all I'll, I'll, I'll say is that as having been involved in this work in a very, various ways for the last 15 years, I'm every, every day I'm impressed by the ability of young people, students your age, to change the situation, to be involved in making schools more sustainable, composting programs, recycling programs, finding new ways to uh, restore nature where they live, finding new ways to make sure that trash doesn't end up all over your school. Um, there's, you all have an amazing capacity to change the world just through the decisions you make every day and what you're learning in school. And that has been the, that's absolutely the best part of my job is getting to see that all the time. And so I encourage you all to you know, try to make a difference in everything that you do. It's a phrase that's overused that this generation, you know, talking about a generation in the collective, but I really think like kids 16 and under, like you guys are the most involved, knowledgeable and passionate group ever when it comes to environmental issues. Like we grew up and everyone assumed my generation would be the one to take the charge. And we were okay. We did pretty well. But like you guys march in groups of 500,000 and you know all the facts. And I mean, I get to see this every day in these programs where you've done all the research in advance of meeting people like Pete. So keep it up. You guys are amazing. Uh, if you guys ever want more environmental projects, reach out. We'd be happy to find you some cool things close to home or globally. And Pete, I just want to say a huge thank you again for joining us as part of the Wild Hope series. What an absolute pleasure. And uh, keep up the amazing work. We'll bring in our class to say farewell. Maryland, BC, Ontario on YouTube. We'd love to, you can yell out at home too. Uh, but classes, thank you so much. Fifth graders, 10th graders, have a wonderful day, everyone.